Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stu again, and this is Stu's News, a review of American high-speed rail happenings over the past month. In this July episode, we will take a look at the news from June of 2023. Let's jump right in with California high-speed rail, capital outlay budget summary. Expenditures were up in April, but still about 30% lower than budgeted. They really need to get that monthly number to $200 million if any significant progress is going to occur. Design build expenditures still increasing, so on the right track, just need to pick up the pace. After taking a hit from the heavy rains in March, construction labor workforce rebounded strongly by 300 workers, almost at the level attained last year. As far as what actually got done in April, we have one structure in Construction Package 4, that's the one at the far southern end of what they're currently building. Speaking of CP4, this earned value chart indicates schedule slippage is dangerously close to occurring for this section. Being that work would have to pick up tremendously to stay above that late line, I think completion being pushed back into 2024 is likely. Last month, we talked about the new risk contingency funds and comparing forecasts to progress. So far, they're faring pretty well. So while there are signs that they're running behind schedule yet again, at least there are positive signs right now that they're staying on budget. That's enough charts, let's return briefly to the Lake Tulare flooding. Here's a satellite image from May 22nd and then June 27th. The predicted expansion of the Tulare Lake bed flooding did not come to fruition and the extent has peaked about where it was last month. Looks like construction should be able to continue sooner than assumed last month. Also, back to California's state budget mentioned last month, the governor and the legislature have come to an agreement. I have not seen high-speed rail mentioned in any of the budget coverage. However, the budget does include a short-term bailout for various transit agencies and infrastructure in general fared well. So it could be worse but the tens of billions needed to build phase one are still nowhere in sight. Lastly, some money from the Federal Railroad Administration program to grade separate road and rail at a crossing utilized by multiple agencies, which would include California high-speed rail once they reach the LA area, goes to show there are many avenues to funding these projects. This amounts to less than half of 1% of the funds needed for phase one, but better than nothing. Goodbye, California. Hello, Nevada. Another quiet month for Brightline West. A couple of tangential articles that illustrate the sometimes bizarre politics that surround this subject. First is with Brightline, Florida, the 100-year-old St. Lucie Bridge and the Coast Guard. The basic problem here is that we shouldn't be building fast trains that come to intersections with watercraft, yet we're running into this time and time again for some reason. In this case, once hourly service to Orlando starts this year, it could be routinely interrupted by this movable bridge until the Coast Guard figures things out or a new bridge is built or both. More closely related to Brightline West is the subject of a secondary relief port in the Gene, Nevada area that Southern Nevada desperately needs because their main airport, Harry Reid International, is set to hit capacity in seven or eight years. Estimated cost on the Relief Airport is about $12 billion, which is the estimated cost of the entire Brightline West project. Remember the cost of a Relief Airport where no one lives, but politicians are only too happy to build anytime anyone tells you high-speed rail infrastructure is too expensive. Why is this related to Brightline West? Because Brightline West right-of-way is set to pass right next to this airport site along the I-15 corridor. This seems like a perfect scenario. Put a Brightline West station there, ferry people back and forth to the Las Vegas area at high speed. But the county commissioner quoted in this piece inexplicably thinks this might lead to people taking the train from California to utilize this new airport and therefore isn't in a big hurry to set that up. This despite the fact that the Brightline West Rancho Cucamonga station is three miles from Ontario International Airport in Ontario, California, and no one in their right mind would pay to ride a train 200 miles from there to fly out of Jean. It's no wonder things can't get done when we're dealing with silliness like this from our politicians. 
Now the old man may be barely breathing, but the heart of Texas Central Rail is still beating. The transparency bill we talked about last month that would have required private high-speed rail projects in Texas to report their inner workings as though they were public projects failed in the Texas legislature. Nothing else from TCR on the subject other than a two-sentence press release. Texas Central Rail lives on, if only just barely. Now let's take a look at what's happening with the Northeast Corridor Anacella. The big news this month is that the new Alstom Avelia Liberties won't be in service until at least next year. This is the locomotive that is supposed to bump Max Acela's speed up to 160 miles per hour and increase seating capacity by 50% per train. Apparently, they're having issues with the crappy old rails on the NEC and need more time to resolve issues before they can be certified. These trains pass testing in Colorado with flying colors, so maybe they need to screw up the Colorado test track on purpose to better simulate our nation's neglected infrastructure. A huge story this month in the I-95 corridor was the collapse of a section of Interstate 95. This happened after a tanker truck caught fire below an I-95 overpass, tragically killing the driver and cooking the concrete until it crumbled. Great work on the part of construction crews in Philly as they managed to reopen a constricted portion of Interstate 95 to traffic less than two weeks after the incident. What does this have to do with Acela, you ask? It shows the need for redundancy in our transportation infrastructure and that the passenger rail and high-speed rail discussion in the United States is usually had in ways that don't fully consider its necessity and benefit. Amtrak has applied for $7.3 billion in federal grants for NEC work. This utilizes the FRA's Federal State Partnership for Inner City Passenger Rail Program. This is the program you hear about whenever someone mentions federal money for high-speed rail, although it's not exclusively for high-speed rail. It's split into NEC funding and non-NEC funding, with the NEC pool being twice the size of the pool for the entire rest of the country. You might wonder why Amtrak would need to apply for anything on the Northeast Corridor. Well, that NEC money is available to various entities on the NEC, not just Amtrak. Here are some examples of the work Amtrak would like to accomplish with these funds. East River Tunnel Rehab. This would bring some 113-year-old tunnels between Manhattan and Queens up to a more modern standard. Susquehanna Bridge demolishes a 117-year-old double-tracked movable bridge and replaces it with two double-tracked bridges for a total of four tracks that will fly over the river and navigational channel. This so far is one of the most high-speed rail appropriate structures I've seen in the NEC backlog. Connecticut River Bridge replaces the existing 116-year-old double-tracked movable bridge. Gee, I'm sensing a theme here. Unfortunately, the replacement is very similar to the original, which will do little to serve high-speed rail. It would increase bridge speed from 45 to 70 miles per hour, although the track geometry doesn't support that, so there's that. This seems like a short to midterm solution until they can manage to bypass this area with a new main line option to the north. Now let's duck into Cascadia High Speed Rail. Last month we talked about STV doing a Cascadia High Speed Rail study review. Well, the results of that review are in. The biggest news is that the anticipated cost has gone up 50% in the last few years and is now projected to be in the 36 to $63 billion range. That's a big range because the project is still in a preliminary phase without a set route. They did, however, look at several route options. We'll likely revisit these ideas when I get around to making a Pacific Northwest Corridor video. On the bright side, interest in utilizing a completed system is strong, which could help when the involved polities have to vote to tax themselves in order to build the thing. And then just a real quick look at the proposed system compared to some others around the world. Let's quickly visit the Midwest. 
Nothing happening in high-speed rail territory there, but new scheduling for Lincoln service, which was recently upgraded to 110 miles per hour, has been released. All that work cut a whopping 15 minutes off the trip. Now it takes about five hours flat, depending on the time of day. That was $2 billion, by the way. This is why I keep harping on this type of service not being enough. We're getting tiny improvements for not tiny amounts of money. Why not quit messing around and build something better? A true high-speed train could make that trip in half the time without breaking a sweat. By the way, it's probably going to be a very long time before you see Chicago Hub back in this monthly update. And now it's time for Stu's Boo Boo's, where we take a look at everything I missed last month. My first boo-boo was quite shameful since I have been obsessing over river and reservoir levels in California for many years. I referred to one of the rivers that flows into Tulare Lake as the Tulare River, and it is of course called the Tule River. Hopefully I'm allowed back in the Central Valley soon. A big thanks to Wiz553 for bringing that shame to light. Boo-boo number two when referring to the architectural style of Washington Union Station in Washington, D.C., I said it was Beau Arts. Apparently, even in the U.S., this French phrase is pronounced as it is in France, or more correctly, Beaux-Arts. You say tomato, I say tomato. I say Paris, you say Paris. C'est la vie. Merci beaucoup à Mike Nogrady. As with last month, if you find any boo-boos in this presentation, point them out in the comments. If it's a good one, you win a prize. More high-speed rail corridor videos on the way, and of course, another Stu's news at the end of July in four weeks. But that's all for now. Until next time, I'll see you on that big, beautiful freeway.